This particular topic is rather well fraught with difficulties, as it isn't without its reasonableness. Unlike some errors I've pointed out in this series, such as anachronistic analysis and gross categorical error, power dynamics have a real sense of something to them. They are not merely errors in thinking, they have some kind of substantive form to them. Bluntly the notion is that in a situation of significant power imbalances, the persons on the weaker side of the power imbalance is or at least may be effectively coerced into doing something. That coercion may be something done maliciously, as in, someone's actively attempting to use their power over someone else via, say, verbalized threat of force related to that power, or, so the position argues, that even the mereness of having that possibility of a threat being used is sufficient. This regardless as to if the threat is actually made, or indeed, regardless of if the person with the greater power even thinks of it, or tries to do it, or is aware of it, they could very well be actively against the abuse of power, yet simply in virtue of them having it, there is the threat of its use. In what is plausibly the least controversial example of this kind of power dynamic, consider the master-slave relationship. Distinguish this from the sexual BDSM kind of relationship, though we'll find it useful to return to that sexual relationship for some clarification on the relevant points. In the master-slave relationship, there is something close to, if not an actualized, maximal power differential involved. The master has the capacity of total domination over the slave, the threat of force, in other words, is always present as an unspoken aspect of the relationship. The slave in fact cannot really simply refuse, they can refuse for sure, but it isn't simply so. The refusal at any given point risks the utilization of the force being used against them to force them to do the thing anyway. Importantly, it follows, and I think fairly well so, that even a yes from a slave to a master is not indicative of consent. Indeed, it is arguable, and again I think not unreasonably so, that there is no instance whereby a slave can possibly give consent. No matter how emphatic, no matter how fervently the slave themselves even believes that they are consenting, nonetheless, it isn't consensual, whatever the thing may be, due to the overwhelming threat of force being leveraged against them. Despite the intuitiveness of this position, it is actually debatable, and I think rightly so, as to if that kind of lacking of consent actually entail rape in the instances of sex. And more broadly, as to if circumstances, even dire circumstances, thereby entail no capacity for consent. The counterpoint is that a slave doesn't thereby actually lose the capacity to say yes. They retain their personal agency, they are not entirely helpless people, they remain human despite their slave status. Hence, while it is plausibly the case that in terms of consent the threat of force entails that there cannot be true consent given, it may also very well be the case that a slave can nonetheless say yes to something and not have the threat of force be the salient motivating factor for them. To be blunt for this piece, in terms of rape, it is plausible for a slave to have sexual desires, and to say yes to sex even with their master for those reasons, and not for the reasons of force. Indeed, among the biggest criticisms of the view being presented here stems specifically from black feminism's critiques of white feminisms, whereby the worry is that the view of the slave as pure victim entails a dehumanization of the slave even in theory. That is, it is to pretend that the slave has no agency, has no personhood to them 
lacks all capacity of thought, action, or any other human characteristic simply by dint of their slavery. In the strongest of such criticisms, it is held that by doing so one perpetuates the horrors of slavery into the present, by denying the slaves of the past the dignity of their humanity, even in theory. By, in essence, dehumanizing them to the point that they are mere puppets. It is to pretend that the slave status was the entirety of their existence, that they had no other aspects to them, no other characteristics, they were literally just meat puppets at the hands of master. A slave couldn't eat, certainly couldn't have consented to eating, without master say so, and even if they did consent to eating, the implicit threat of force from master's whip would've robbed them of the capacity to have consented to eating. Which sounds unlikely. In terms of sexuality and consent, the worry is that the position denies the capacity of free will, indeed, denies the capacity of sexual desire, insofar as one is in undesirable circumstances. It presents folks as passive fuck dolls, rather than active agents with desires all their own, even when in circumstances that are far less than desirable. Folks ought hear echoes of this author's general criticisms regarding the feminine demure. Gentler religious readers might do well to utilize that argument as a reason why humans have free will to otherwise would entail a non-consensual arrangement with the divine. A similarly extreme sort of example of this is if a gun is put to your head and you are asked to do something, the threat of violence being used makes it an act of coercion. That threat of violence taking the form rather explicitly as a power differential related to death. These are the bare positive interpretations, the sound intuitions that undergird the understanding of power dynamics as being, oh, hmm, problematic. In particular this view is applied to sexual dynamic relations to hold that in instances of there being a power imbalance, there can be no consent. The threat of force being used entailing that no consent is really possible in such situations. This is in the current the most oft-utilized form of the argument. Hence, the argument runs, and runs more dubiously, that because men are physically stronger, there is always a threat of violence involved in heterosexual relationships, hence all heterosexual acts are coerced, and therefore no consent is had. All heterosexual acts are rape. Sometimes this is put more gently, as justification for positive consent requirements. To avoid the issue raised, in other words, the notion is that the weaker of the two lovers must give vocal affirmative consent in order for the sexual interaction to be considered consensual. But note that this more gentle position is actually predicated upon the less gentle position. Prima facie heterosexual sex is rape, at the very least some sort of sex negative kind of interaction, in desperate need of an affirmation on the part of the otherwise victim in the interaction in order to make it okay. We might also refer the notion to economic concerns, whereby the life or death threat implied by not having money, the requirement to work to live, entails an implicit threat of violence, much as if having a gun to one's head. Given the degree whereby I have personally utilized that as a motivation of ethical concern in the moneyless free labor society's peace, one can get a sense that I am not entirely unsympathetic to the concern. As I said, there is actually a something to this concern that is worth taking seriously. Here we've set up three different kinds of examples of power dynamics,
each of which are actually worth exploring to get a sense of the whys of reason for this concern, as well as its lunitantic whys. There is the economic aspect, the consent aspect, and the BDSM sexual aspect. The economic aspect is perhaps illuminating in that it dovetails the relevant concerns with those concerns of broad social coercion. It takes what is oft enough a kind of complaint that folks who are opposed to this line of reasoning in general, and weds them to the notion. Notes that the two notions do actually have something rather significant in common with each other. The requirement to work to live is very much the expressed use of force to make people do things they otherwise might not do. To repurpose a phrase, money is just slavery with extra steps involved. This is a rather deep problem as it is dealing with the issues of organizing societies in general. Among the things seriously worth considering is to what extent is such coercion warranted. Even within the moneyless free labor society's piece, the utilization of a standard work week is broadly thought to be required. Such is in some sense at any rate a work-to-live kind of thing. While that requirement may be far less than the current and indeed aims rather explicitly to be far less forceful a thing, by expanding what is included as legitimate labors and decoupling the abstracted societal force from the whips of money, nonetheless the point stands that there is some non-trivial sense whereby a requirement to work in order to live is utilized. And, I'd add, that that requirement may very well be just. There is something of a power imbalance within that, but it is fairly well abstracted. There isn't a person or agency that is particularly tasked with enforcing it, there is just the bland societal norm of behavior. A thing that is taught to do, to which people generally just thereby do it. We might hold that such amounts to a consent to be forced into that situation, by dint of the reasonableness of the situation. Which brings forth among the most important criticisms and limitations of this notion, it is very plausibly the case that folks may simply actually consent to be within those kinds of power imbalance relationships without ever actually vocalizing it. In this case we are speaking of a fairly abstracted entity to which folks are consenting to, that of cultural norms of behavior and the social good. But the point really is that there is something good there whereby the power imbalance actually provides for. Consenting to exist at all within a society, in some non-trivial sense, also entails consenting to at least nominally live by the social norms of that society. In terms of sexual norms of behavior, the consenting involved is not so directly related to individual person-to-person -person interactions. Or rather, what constitutes consent or not is not so strictly delimited. Consent has a rather significant socio-cultural component to it, whereby consent is given in virtue of the cultural norms within which one is living. What, when, where and why a kiss is given has much to do with cultural norms, and only secondarily does it have to do with the individuals doing the kissing. The cultural norms entail the initial state of consent, the arena within which the individuals then give, refuse, revoke or reinvigorate consent in the individual instances. Folks interested in this topic might do well to refer to notions of the social contract and really a fairly wide array of topics in philosophy that discuss this sort of concern. I'll mention a couple, a master and student in the modern times that are of significant relevance to the current discourse on the topic, Rawls and Nussbaum. Despite its more recent popularity via the feminisms and other issues, the point of coercion 
when is it just, when isn't it just, is not new. Though it may be surprising to many folks to learn that, Philosophers been gabbing about that particular point for thousands of years now. Here, however, I want to point rather specifically to among the oldest of such arguments as I think it far more pragmatically illustrative of the relevant points, the Apology. The Trials of Socrates. In it, the choice of death or exile is given, with the advantages and disadvantages the thereof being discussed. The Apology's relevance to the topic extends a great deal beyond what I am going to provide here of it, hence it is worth a read for folks that actually want to try with the topic. What I want to provide here of it is just these points. Society provides for a lot of good. Rather specifically, lots of goods and services, but in some sense also a lot of good in the abstracted sense of that term. Things that are provided for rather straightforwardly so via a willing submission to the overall will of the state, or perhaps we may muse that some, and say a willing submission to the community, to others, to businesses, etc. These other entities that in effect raise us, teach us, birth us, feed us, clothe us, and so forth. These things that, so the argument goes, simply do not exist without that kind of submission, without, that is, a granting of exactly that power imbalance. Death may very well be preferable, so Socrates argues. Again, I am not really doing the apology justice, it is worth a read for folks interested in this topic. But I don't think I am maligning it either. The upshot for this piece being that that power imbalance may be a good. Not something to be lamented. The power imbalance may be just for exactly that reason and we may very well find that that is the case in other instances of concern. I definitely caution folks from taking that to an extreme, whereby the state, community, business, etc. can do no wrong. What it is suggestive of is that power imbalances are not inherently bad, perhaps even if they are inherently coercive, which is likely a bitter pill for some folks to swallow. It is also suggestive that there is something to even those kinds of non-bad instances of coercion via power imbalances whereby something bad can nonetheless occur. Hence we have the concept of abuse of power. In terms of sexual relations, rather bluntly put, the inherent power imbalance in physical strength may be a good. Namely, that power imbalance provides the means of asymmetrical physical relations. Being tossed around in bed. Being pinned down and held down as a matter of course for the sexual encounter. Less forcefully put too, simply the capacity to be held, even held up, encircled by another, the feelings that come from having someone larger than you take care of you. Likewise, being smaller, physically weaker, being vulnerable, being willfully wanting of being held up and pinned down, of being tossed round and round, of wanting to be tied, just to be held tighter, to be warmly snuggled within the bosoms and the large arms of another. There is nothing obviously bad about such things. Next I want to take a look at the BDSM, master-slave, kind of relationship. I feel it important to distinguish this from that of actual master-slave relations. Slaves don't generally have power over their masters, and insofar as they may have, it is not of the same sort as being described with BDSM-styled sexual relationships. I'd caution folks to tread carefully in any analogous considerations given to actual master-slave relationships.
At least nominally BDSM, master-slave relationships present themselves as pretty straightforward examples of consent being given to effectively have a major power imbalance within which an activity is done. Among the key aspects there I want to point out is that in such instances the slaves in that dynamic actually have a great deal of power. The S's in M S or D S relationships rather explicitly have a great deal of power, the power imbalances involved are not all that they appear to be given the names. For one thing, the S's are wanting of such things. There is a willingness to the actions involved, even though they themselves are not the ones actively doing the actions of obvious command. Moreover, there is a dynamic that belies the names involved, whereby the S's do things of a sort to entice, to allure, in order that in fact someone else can do the thing they want to get done. In this case, get fucked. There is, in other words, agency involved, not merely in the initiation of the act, that is, not merely in the initial consent to be either of the S's, but also throughout the involvement. These are perhaps the more subtle aspects of relationships to which folks are, who, well, oft enough they are or seem to be unaware of them. The dispositions whereby a silence, a lull in the push, a letting something happen, each of these actually entails a directive of the will of the S's. When in this piece, or any other, I speak of the feminine demure, this is at least one aspect to which I refer. It is an agency of action that can get lost in all the whips and chains. Choke me with your belt is not a directive of the person doing the choking. More subtle still, simply drawing attention to a luscious little throat may be exactly what the asses do in order to entice someone to take their belt off and choke them. A lacking of something that ought to have happened, but simply hasn't happened by want of action. Hit me is a cry of desperation from the very quiet. Now, that is all fine and dandy in the bedroom, in the subtleties and intricacies of sex and love, but not applicable to the real world. Alas, they are. The thing to learn from this kind of sexual dynamic is that power imbalances are far more subtle than folks give them credit for. What on first glance appears to be a power imbalance of proper maximal form, the master over the slave, the dom over the sub, in actuality can very well be the S's expressing their own power, indeed, being far more powerful and controlling of the situations, that their own desires, needs and wants may be met. Here we can get to such fair obtuse points, but points of relevance, such as the role of the worker bees. Those people who go forth to do the things they do. To make the honey, to make the money, to make the goods and services we all thereby use. To do that sort of labor, that, I don't have to. A relinquishing of the power to, for instance, make beer, that someone else might thereby make the beers we drink. The alternative being exile, being tossed forth from the realms of societies, to be forced by dint of no one else doing the labor, to do the labor thyself. Why don't I just make my own beer? Well, perhaps wine, but the point stands. I may, at times. I may for the fun of it, the joy of it all. But why wouldn't I just let someone else do it? Here now, I think we can get at some of the technical and practical points regarding consent within power imbalance relationships. To what power exactly is being referred to? Why is that power being singled out? 
How is that power more relevant than any of the other powers that may be in play? This seems to be a rather striking shortcoming in the current discourses on the topic, regardless of if we are speaking of criticism of the position, or adherence to it. To foreshadow later pieces in this series, how oft, how much, do the S's fail to get consent from the M's and D's? How oft are these more subtle forms of power actually forcing a situation to their own desires, needs, and wants? There are a plethora of powers in play in any given situation, and each participant presumably has the same capacity of will, the same agency of note. This ought be clear from black feminism's criticism of white feminism's take on the actual slave. Do not rob the slave of their humanity any more than it already was. If the actual in real life no holds barred slave continues to have agency, and indeed, some powers bout themselves and at their command, what does that say of these far more ephemeral kinds of power dynamics? If speaking of economic power disparities, for instance, the power associated with it may come one way. But that doesn't entail that there are no other powers in play within that relationship. Somewhat infamously, the notion of marrying up is a very willful sort of thing that folks lower down on the economic ladder try to do, and they utilize a wide variety of means at their disposal to do so. Being the stay-at-home person, the non-breadwinner, non-honey maker, non-money shaker, doesn't actually entail not having any power at all. Without being overly flippant about the role, keeping house, raising babies, and such is real labor, the point is that the person earning that cash isn't the only person spending that cash. Nor the only person with power in the relationship. Indeed, I have very oft looked with no small amount of pity upon the poor worker bees and wonder much if they are merely being used. The point there being that as a matter of coercion there isn't a whole lot to be said of the matter. Did the person use their money to get the lover they wanted? Perhaps. Certainly this is the case, by dint of having money, any lover they would approach would utilize their money as means of measure of the lover. Poor or rich, either way, when you approach a lover, that aspect of the world, the moneyed aspect of the society, is one element that is in play. Perhaps the poorer person indeed found them attractive explicitly for their money. Perhaps it was merely one aspect among many that made them attractive. Perhaps the poor person was attractive for their poverty. Perhaps they were seen as susceptible to the influences of wealth whereby to become lovers. And hence they were approached. These can all be true, and yet not necessarily unethical. If it wasn't money, we might muse, it would be something else. Their beauty, their force of personality, their kindness, their prowess in bed, their smarts and wit, their sense of humor, etc. Each of these metrics can, but ought not, be understood as metrics of power that people can utilize to find their lovers. But, insofar as we are speaking of power imbalances, we might well wonder at each of these, if only to point out the absurdities involved in such an analysis. Power imbalances by brain power, gasp, oh my, did they, outwit their lover? Power imbalances by humor, oh my, did they make their lover laugh to submission? Power imbalances by sexual prowess, oh no, did they make their lover come themselves to quietude? Power imbalances by kindness, sheer terror, were they killed by kindness? The problem may very well be the speaking of these things as power considerations. <laughs>
Again, there are instances, demonstrable instances, whereby power imbalances are in and of themselves coercive. I don't think this can really be denied. Moreover, these power imbalances have had and continue to have real-world manifestations. Actual slavery was and is a thing after all. Socio-cultural constructs are a thing. Work to live is a thing. Grooming in the sense of predating on an underage person in order to get with them when they come of age is a thing. The questions are, however, to what degree does this translate to other aspects of relationships in an unjust manner? That is, what power imbalances are, on balance, unjust? Which ones are just? To what degree does a power imbalance entail a lack of consent? And how can we differentiate coercive practices from wooing? Consider, what might we do more harm than good trying to correct for? As noted elsewhere in this series, on this topic even, if we were to take the economic power imbalances as inherently coercive to sexual relationships, and hence as ethically or legally prohibitive, we end up in a literal caste system. Folks cannot marry beyond their caste. To fuck beneath their caste is to fuck beneath them. And to be in the lower castes is to never fuck above them. Why would I lower myself to love and be sexual with someone from the lower castes? I would thereby dirty my cock and misplant my seed. And perhaps we may muse the lower castes are worthwhile for a fuck, but not of love. Do you have the smarts and wits? Alas, that one over there is of a different intellectual caliber. It would be inherently wrong that you were to fuck them, let alone show them the grace of love. They wouldn't have capacity to choose. They are, after all, too dumb, too far flungly under your sway to say nay. Are you a hottie? Do clothes magically fall from your body? Alas, that one over there isn't in your league. They far and away too ugly. They likely think they just lucky to be with you. You using your looks to control them. They too ugly to be able to think straightly for themselves. Do you make them come a lot? Are you sir comes a lot? Well, you can't be using your good fucking to control someone. They only there for that good dick, that good lick, that sweet bum, or those tasty lips. Clearly there is a power imbalance here and clearly they using it to sublimate the other's will to their own. Here's the things, all these things can be true, but really only in the most cynical of senses. One would have to assume that there is a mischievousness behind the intent, beyond the wanting of sex and love. One could perhaps also hold to a sex-negative viewpoint to make that all make sense. If there is something inherently wrong with sex, then the actions involved in sexuality, the courting, the flirtatiousness, the tryings, the working hard for one's lovers, these all take on a nefarious character to them. Am I being used for sex? I can answer yes to that, and the response can be thank you or boo, depending on the view regarding sexuality in general. A positivist view of sexuality looks upon that and says, Oh good, yes please, me too. After all, the using for sexuality is at least partly the point of sex as sex. One does not necessarily fuck for reasons that have nothing whatsoever to do with fucking, and that isn't necessarily in need of justification to become good. Course. If one views sexuality as a bad, as a negative in need of justification, fucking to fuck, 
being used for one's sex, being sexually used, becomes in desperate need of justification. Lacking some other aspect to make the sex good it is a bad, not even a neutral. The begging of sex becomes a begging for justification, rather than a begging for it to happen at all, or a begging for the good of it all. The alluring, the flirtatiousness, the hard work to make oneself attractive for a lover, the putting forth of a good foot, the working upon one's intellect, stature, social standing, worth and value, these all become bads. Sexual things, supplied by their sexuality, in need of justification. Looking good, being good for one's lover isn't enough, there has to be some further thing, something further to the point. Having stacks of cash becomes a cudgel instead of a gentle lure. Holding a position of culturally accrued stature becomes a principle of power rather than peacock's feathers. A piece of poetry becomes poisoning words of coercion, instead of honeyed ambrosia to taste of. In sum on this point, all aspects of sexuality become power imbalances to be suspect of, rather than beautiful allures to be loving to. One could be convinced by such words as these to hold that the feeling of helplessness in the presence of love's many moods moves people to a position of fearful loathing. To listen to whispering words that capture one's desires, that brace them for a bracing embrace and love's grace of presence, may also thereby cause one to pull back in fear of that unknown before them. As if to be fearful of an emotion, perhaps especially an emotion that is not strictly of their own devices. Like to come across a lover to be, in the light of love, and to literally gasp at it, have one's breath taken from them in the beholding of their glory, and then fearfully turn away. That emotion, they might think or say, is not my own. That emotion does not stem from within me, but rather, from something other than me. That emotion is foreign to me. That emotion takes upon me something I do not fully recognize. That emotion is something that allures me, and perhaps, just perhaps, I am too scared to follow through with it. To behold some beautiful being, whose beauty, whose ambrosia of words makes sweet drippings for thirsty lips, and simply say, okay, and, yes, please, and even, thank you, sir, may I have another. Those kinds of emotions strike deeply at the heart of the cynic, the sex negativist, the anti-lover, the self-lover, who wants control, who needs control in order to feel something, perhaps to feel anything at all. But, they are in fact, self-lovers, such emotions of loves may indeed be foreign to them. They may be the very things they need, want, and desire, alas, they too blind to see it. Perhaps they so deprive of it that they fail to even recognize it when it arrives on their doorstep. Now we must have to be alone and we can't say our sweet things on a telephone if we can't stop what we've begun we should say goodbye and go back home when the day is done do you still like me well I hope you do Cause if you're still like me, then I think I'm gonna have to still like you. We shared our things and had some fun. Now we'll say goodbye and go back home when the day is done. Yeah, we'll say goodbye and go back home while we still have one. Let's say goodbye. 
go back home now the day is done Yemitlo. Yeah,